actually, um, I used to know our guest speaker as just Greg, um, community organizer, working with R Workers' Defense Project, um, tireless working, and then had a conversation, he's thinking about maybe running for city council. And if you've been to the city council and heard him speak, um, you get a sense of the prophetic voice that he is in this community. And when I say he really was arrested in the governor's office, I had the honor of being right next to him. Um, now I squealed, so I reported, you know, uh, not really, I, I just, um, but um, when you go to the, well, we had an a event at the governor's mansion uh, a week ago, and Greg used some swear words um, in the most appropriate way I think I've ever heard them, which is indignation at how unsheltered people are being treated uh, by the governor of the state. And um, the city council has done such a courageous job of decriminalizing homelessness, and everybody there realizes that's not the final answer. Uh, but neither is criminalizing people for being poor. So we all realize there's challenges and problems, but this is a man who um, was there when SB4 was, you know, the kind of torturous bill against the undocumented. Uh, he's been there for homeless people. No politician can be, you know, we have it easy as activists. We get to say right and wrong kind of stuff, but then when you're in power, you never get those pure choices of good and evil. But I think uh, you always have a sense of the pole star, the ethical pole star. So um, please join me in welcoming a very courageous friend, Greg. Good afternoon, how are y'all? Thank you so much for having me. Uh, and, and thanks for being there, uh, getting rested with me, Jim, and through all this time. Um, I, I also hate that I'm shortly following uh, Ms. Goldfinch and uh, Representative Tallarico. I short, watched a little bit of James's video and he was like so incredibly uh, prepared and so amazing. I've got my little piece of paper here so that I can try to uh, keep up with him some. But uh, as, uh, as Jim mentioned, I was a community organizer before uh, doing this work and, uh, and I still try to hold on to that organizing spirit in this job. And uh, so much of the title of this talk about sort of what our common thread and our common humanity is, I think is what we're called to do as activists and as organizers and what we need to better do as elected officials is find ways to, mo to bring everybody together to find our common humanity and to actually address the, the, the difference between who we see as human and who it is that we who it is that we do not. And, uh, and in trying, in, in part, to still sort of remain the organizer that I was, I actually have a little post-it note in my office with a little camera drawn on it. And it's supposed to be sort of like a little wormhole that I'm watching myself from, back from when I was 20 years old, to see how it is that I'm doing. And that tries to sort of keep me firmly planted in uh, still being an organizer. Uh, and I think the last time I came and talked here, maybe I was just one, one year into, into elected office, even though it's felt like such a long time. Yeah, no. So, um, so what I uh, want to talk about and center, sort of center some of my talk about has been, is is that space of what, how it is that we can find that common thread and push our institutions and one another and the powerful to better reflect that common thread of our common and shared humanity. As an organizer and as an activist, just like y'all, I saw so many gaps in our community, gaps between rich and poor racial gaps, gaps between East and West, gaps between how we treated some people versus other people, service gaps. But one of the greatest gaps is the gap between what our leaders said they stood for and what they actually did. And so much of that gap of why leaders would say they stood for something but did something else is because um, as leaders, if you're an elected leader or a politician, but also if you're um, somebody in power economically or institutionally, you want to express shared values with the people that you lead. Be those the constitutional values of every person having equal rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, or we the people uh, who form this more perfect union, or our 
ethical and faith-based and moral values of loving your neighbor as you uh, love yourself and treating your neighbor as you treat yourself. Every, all of, everybody wants to say that we stand for those values, but so clearly out in the world uh, and from those leaders, we don't see those values actually happening um, on the ground with everyday people, right? How could everybody have equal right to life if even within our own city, if you live in one zip code on one part of town versus another part of town, the life expectancy difference between some parts of town and others is over 20 years. Um, there's actually a map that the city has produced of each zip code with a little number in it. And the little number gets smaller and smaller and the, uh, and the zip code gets darker and darker the smaller the number is. And that is the number of years that someone is expected to live. And it is just the starkest color difference and the starkest divide, one of the saddest maps of the city that you could see. Or how could everybody have an equal right to liberty in a society, in a country that incarcerates more people than anywhere else in the world, right? And how can we say love your neighbor as you love yourself? But the question is who qualifies as a neighbor? Is there an asterisk on who a neighbor is or isn't? And I want to talk a little bit about that when we talk about homelessness or immigration issues or who is actually included in we the people because obviously when that was written we were a country that was half free and half enslaved, a country that said well we the people doesn't include the native and indigenous folks that have to get pushed out for we the people to exist here. And so there's always been this real challenge of who is included in the us. You know, who is considered human like us? And so much of the organizing push and so much of, I think, the work that we have to do is figuring out how to close that gap and how to be radically inclusive or just inclusive. Uh, and so as an organizer, the first campaign that I ever worked on uh, in the city of Austin, I was 21 years old and I think you were there. Um, it was uh, asking for the city of Austin to guarantee every working person in the city the right to a water break, uh, just the right to get a drink of water because there were people in our community who were building the beautiful buildings and expanding the highways who weren't being let to come down from the scaffolds during the hot summer days. And we actually had folks dying just because they weren't given a water break. And that actually was a lot of work, uh, sadly enough, but it's because there was this gap between who really us is, who the city was supposed to serve. Was it just supposed to continue to serve the interests of general economic development or the powerful or the folks that had always been around City Hall? Or what about the actual people who were building the city? And so, so much of the work that we had to do was bringing everyday people uh, together who thought that, that if you're a construction worker or you're a landscape worker and you're working out of the sun, sun, you are part of we the people and you deserve that level of respect and that level of protection from the city. And then to have the families of workers who had died uh, come forward to City Hall and working people who actually worked in the sun come and be a part of the we the city of Austin or we the people or the neighbor that you're supposed to take care of. And after months and months, we managed to, to shift the narrative at the city that, that, that they are supposed to be a part of we the people and so maybe they should have a guaranteed right to a water break. And then we started asking other questions. Well, what about the fact that city contracts let people pay as little as $7.25 an hour back then? Or what if about city employees getting paid as little as $7.25 an hour? Or what about all the people who aren't given the right to take a day off of work when they're sick, who have to choose between taking care of a sick child and paying the rent. And so we kept on asking those sorts of questions and that is so much of what the organizing work as an elected official has been, has been to actually bring those folks, uh, bring more people closer into the halls of power to, to, to raise those contradictions between, uh, to say that, that, that you should be included as well, that folks should also be considered equal parts um, of our city. And as we do that, of course, we're in the context of of there being lots of other political forces trying to not actually be inclusive and to unite, but actually to say that there are, there are people that are not we the people. There are people who are undeserving. There are people who are criminal. There are people who are wrong. This myth that our society is full of moochers that you need to be worried about, that, they sh that people don't deserve to be protected. And I really started to see that more clearly than ever when I started working on a campaign for fair chance hiring. So I was a brand new elected official and something that we thought was really important to work on was there are so many folks 
who are coming out of the criminal justice system, who are being denied just a fair shot at an interview, a fair shot at a job. So many people who on their job application wrote out, wrote out all their qualifications and then had to check the box on a job application saying, I'm formally incarcerated or I have a conviction history. And then they would have their job application tossed out in the trash. One of the most powerful stories I'd heard was actually from a young man born and raised here in Austin who was incarcerated in his late teens, uh, spent 10 years in prison on a drug charge, and in prison learned to assemble and fix microchip boards for some of the companies here in town, working with you know, some of the high-tech firms off of TechRidge to work on uh, these circuit boards. And on coming out of prison, he had learned this skill, and so he went and applied for the exact same job, doing the exact same work that he'd been doing while incarcerated. And he was denied employment. He was denied the job based on his criminal history. Even though he had already been doing the job for them, of course, for way lower pay while in jail. And so again, it starts to make so clear that there is this, uh, this myth-making, this stigma. Of course, it would be no surprise to anybody that he's a person of color, African-American, working class person who of course, there are those folks that benefit from politically and economically saying, well, you aren't part of we the people. You don't deserve those equal levels of protections. And it starts to be really clear that it, it wasn't an issue with him. It was an issue with the rules and with the system as it, is, as it has been created for, um, for certain people. And there's never been a more clear example of sort of this oldest political trick in the book of saying there are certain groups of people who aren't uh, a part of us than with uh, Donald Trump announcing his run for the presidency in 2015 when he came down that escalator and said, you know, uh, they're coming from Mexico, they're criminals, they're rapists, I'm sure some of them are good people, but they are not sending their best. Right, we've heard that sort of refrain so many times over and over that it has to do with those people and it doesn't have to do with us or with the rules that we've set up. It doesn't have to do with the people trying to spread fear about another group of people. And, and we've heard that again and again where it's, well, this group of people isn't part of us or these people aren't your neighbors until we realize that we've actually become and been told to be so fractured or so afraid of other people that we can never come together around a common purpose, which I think is the, the, the divider's uh, whole purpose in, in the first place. So on the issue of, of immigration that has been, it's been such a powerful tool to say that our undocumented neighbors are undocumented because of their choice, because there's something wrong with them, rather than they're undocumented because the rules we have set have predetermined that folks will be undocumented, that there is something wrong with those rules, that migration has always been a part of this community and human society as a whole. Uh, my own uh, grandmother was carried across the border from Mexico to El Paso uh, during the war in, uh, in Mexico. She then moved back to Mexico where my uh, parents were born and then my parents moved back to uh, Texas here where I was born. Uh, you know, I recognize quite a bit that we are in a church and I you know, was raised in a Catholic tradition where I learned about uh, Mary and Joseph escaping King Herod, crossing the Rio Grande into Egypt uh, um, to be safe, right? And it's, it's always been a part of who we are and it's not that that migration itself is wrong, it's that the systems have very clearly been set up so that we can say some people are wrong. And when people can say that some folks are wrong and make sure that those folks don't get a chance to vote and make sure that those folks have to work and pay their taxes but aren't going to have a say in their political system, then it tends to be really convenient to, de to demagogue about those folks. And that has been so much the history um, uh, that we have had in this country and that we're still facing today. And so right after um, Donald Trump's election, this community stood up and said, we don't want people to continue to get deported out of our jails because if somebody just gets stopped for a traffic ticket or even gets stopped for something somewhat more serious, that they should be treated equally uh, compared to everybody else and not potentially face deportation as the remedy no matter what it is that it was that you did. And the response from our governor and from uh, the president was for there to be raids in this city 
and it was uh, a horrifying and terrible experience for so many of us here and so many of our neighbors and so many of my uh, constituents. Uh, there were people who had actually uh, duct taped blankets across their windows, constituents that I met that fled their homes that they even owned. Um, because people that had been here for decades um, fleeing this city, moving, going into hiding again because you know sometimes people have been here 15, 20 years. How much more we the people, how much more your neighbor could that person have been? But for there being a political interest in saying no, they're not a, a part of us. They are a rule breaker. They're co costing us money in our schools or they're costing us money in social services even though they're the people that are building buildings not getting water breaks, even though they're the folks cleaning every single building for the lowest level of wages. In fact, oftentimes the greatest philanthropists uh, in our community being targeted and said, you are uh, less than or you are part of the moochers or you're part of the folks that are taking advantage of us, the people, and continuing to break up the idea that actually we're all one community. So part of what I was really proud of Austin's response to those raids in that, in that moment was that we came together and said, no, those folks are actually us too. That love your neighbors does not come with an asterisk on it. It actually does mean all of your neighbors on all of our streets. And this community came together and established the first publicly funded deportation defense fund in Texas that actually inspired San Antonio and Dallas to invest in their own funds because many people wind up being deported just because they can't afford a lawyer. And if they had that lawyer, if they had that legal defense, um, they have no right to, to legal counsel in those sorts of proceedings. And so actually helping fund that right has kept many people in this community. A small amount of money went a really long way. And we actually established uh, because after that sit-in at the governor's mansion, a statewide movement to have all the major metropolitan areas in Texas sue the governor to try to slow the uh, implementation of Senate Bill 4, which is really a bill targeted to accelerate the deportation process coming down from the federal administration. And out of that court case, there came a lot of hope, a lot of people who I knew who had taped those blankets up in their windows maybe not even knowing exactly what the court case was gonna do, but have some sense that people in Austin cared about every other person in Austin. And coming out of that court case, we actually lost most of it. But one key part that we did win was the courts said, while well, the new laws of the state of Texas say that police officers have to be able to ask folks, show me your papers, the court said, but that's all the law says. It doesn't say what, what else the police officers do or don't have to say or do. And so now the policy in Austin, Texas, coming out of that court case, coming out of that sit-in at the governor's mansion is, okay, police officers have to be able to ask folks, show me your papers. But before they say that, they're required to say, I'm about to ask you a question. You don't have to answer the following question. And if you don't answer it, there's nothing I can or will do. Do you understand? And then they're allowed to ask that question. And so it's that kind of local resistance work, that kind of standing up and saying, we, we actually stand apart from uh, the fear-mongering and the divisiveness coming down. We actually uh, want to work to show people that we do believe everybody is a part of our neighborhoods is something that we've been able to, to strive to do in Austin. And one of the latest challenges in striving to say that every single person is our neighbor uh, has been on the issue, as Jim said, of homelessness, because we've tried to reflect those same sorts of values uh, that we've tried to reflect on workers' rights or those same sorts of values that we tried to reflect on immigration, on how it is that we address uh, the thousands of people experiencing homelessness in our community. We um, have had for, had for over two decades laws that said it is a criminal act to sleep outdoors in our city a criminal act to ask for money uh, in the evening in our city, a criminal act to ask for money on a street corner, a criminal act to sit on a sidewalk anywhere in the downtown area in our city. We had those laws for decades and homelessness did not go away. I don't know if anyone noticed, but banning sitting on a sidewalk for two decades did not result in suddenly there not being poverty in our city and everybody you know, getting a high paying job and having a, a house. In fact, what it did result in, we did an audit 
and it resulted that in, in the course of about two to three years where we audited those laws, there were 18,000 criminal citations given out to people experiencing homelessness for the mere act of existing because effectively existing as a person experiencing homelessness was a criminal act. Of those, nearly 80% of those tickets turned into arrest warrants because people couldn't pay them because they're people experiencing homelessness. So of course they couldn't pay them. And uh, that led to people uh, just being churned in and out of the jail, churned in and out of the emergency room. Some folks hiding in the woods and the back alleys where assault and theft are even more pervasive than living under a bridge. Um, and so the city council decided that we needed to come up with a plan to virtually end homelessness in the city, which means it's a pretty radical idea, which means that we can never make sure that no person loses their home, but that if we found someone on the street, we would have a system that within 60 days, we would have a place for them to go. And we began significantly investing in that while knowing deep down that we still had these horrible laws in place. And so we wrote down in our plan that we would have to change and get rid of these laws at some point as we were trying to do better and better. We bas basically saying we recognize that you are our neighbors. We recognize that you deserve to have a better place to live than on the street. We're going to work as hard and fast as we can under the laws of the state of Texas to get people into shelter and into temporary housing and into bridge housing and into apartments. But that while you sleep on the street and wait for us to make up for the wrong that we've done over so long, that the least we can do is not wake you up in the middle of the night and give you a ticket that you can't pay for, or wake you up in the middle of the night and recognize you didn't pay for your ticket and drag you to the jail. And that the least we can do is let you have a small tent under the bridge so that when it gets cold or that when it gets rainy, we're not gonna be so cruel as to first not have housed you and then second to potentially jail you because you pitched a tent to protect your belongings and to protect yourself. And as so for those of you who watch the news or read the news, there has been quite a bit of discussion about that topic. Um, uh, but so much of it comes down to the question of, are folks living on the street our neighbors? And actually, I'm going to grab my phone really quick because I don't want to say these words out loud and not, um, where did I put that? I think I put it over here. Sorry. I hit it. And, and, and that exact point um, has been um, actually really discussed, is whether folks are or indeed are not our neighbors. And the reason I have to read it is because I would just hate to say the, the words out loud unless I'm like reading them off a screen and you'll understand why. So a bit of a trigger warning. But soon after those change in those laws, there was a big forum at the University of Texas to discuss what it is that I just talked about and what I'm sure you guys will have questions about. And uh, the head of the local Republican Party named Matt McCoviak wrote an essay in response to that forum. And he said the following. At a forum last week, an activist on the panel named Chris Harris said, homeless people in your neighborhoods are your neighbors. This is absurd. They are transients. Neighbors are people who live in a community and pay money to be there. And, and, and right, it's, it's confusing, it's harsh, it's wrong in my view, but it's also so honest, right? He was so honestly expressing, I think, the challenge of what we're facing, right? Um, we just announced that we are going to uh, potentially, most likely buy uh, a motel off of I-35 with about 80 rooms because there are folks who stay on the street but moving into a shelter isn't good for them because they've got their spouse and you get separated from your spouse uh, by gender at shelters or have their dog and they can't have their dog in a shelter and so having a key in a room, however small it might be, is important for someone. And so much of the reaction that you've seen online, could see online is people saying, well, how does that keep other folks from maybe moving here and taking advantage of it or shouldn't these folks be able to get housing themselves? The same folks that are that might have been upset that they think the city is not doing enough when we step up to do something say, well, why are, essentially to, to its core saying, are these folks our neighbors? Are these folks deserving? And apart from the fact that it is a myth that there are tons of people experiencing homelessness all flooding to Austin, it's not true. Actually, we do a census every year of people living on the street and well over 80% of them 
lost their homes while living in Austin, and that doesn't even count the people who lost their homes while living in Bastrop or living somewhere nearby. But even putting that aside, the question of should, do we have a responsibility or not to our neighbors is really core to this question of homelessness in our community. And you could tell, and, we, I, and I believe that it's still, it doesn't mean there shouldn't be rules, that it's still fair to tell my neighbor uh, and for us to decide what rules might be about how we treat one another, whether you are housed or unhoused, or how we use public space, whether you're housed or unhoused. But this dehumanization of people, of saying that, the, that folks are undeserving, that the reason that they're on the street is because of their own uh, choices and it has nothing to do with us, is us continuing to follow that same pattern, that the reason people didn't have water on the scaffolds was their own choice. Why didn't they just get themselves a better job, right? Or the fact that somebody was escaping violence and crossed the border 25 years ago is their own fault. Why weren't they just born somewhere better, right? Um, and, and that has nothing to do with us. It had nothing to do with the rules that we set up that you could work without a water break or nothing to do with the rules that we set up that you, uh, that we're not gonna have comprehensive immigration reform for a few decades. Same thing with folks experiencing homelessness. The most common causes of homelessness are things like you had a huge medical bill that you couldn't pay. In a state that has refused to expand Medicaid, um, or a state that has the highest number of people uninsured of any other state, or because of domestic violence, one of the hugest drivers of homelessness, or the rent going up and wages staying low in a state that mandates by law that the minimum wage in the state of Texas shall be as low as allowable by federal law. I mean, the idea that, that folks experiencing mental health issues didn't potentially develop them while on the street, and if they did develop them while on the street, uh, we're the 49th state out of 50 in our expenditures addressing mental health. And so our neighbors are our neighbors, and, it, and the more we get told that it just has to do with them and it has nothing to do with us, it continues to replicate those systems of saying, well, there's we the people, and then there's the asterisk people. And so that has been so much of what I've, of what I've come to learn and grapple with, and I'm still figuring out as an elected official still trying to hold on to some part of being an organizer, is how is it that we as a community can speak back and be an example and, and wrestle with our own questions of who is we, but how in this moment where there's so much state and national acrimony picking on certain groups of people saying they aren't folks just like us, how is it that we can work together? People with some amount of power in institutions or in local government or in your own service organization or your own faith organization to stand up and say, no, we want to actually um, show what caring for our neighbors and actually doing what we say we believe in uh, can look like. And I've seen this community do that in really incredible ways uh, on so many different issues. But I think this question coming up around whether people experiencing homelessness are our neighbors, uh, no matter what their stories may be, is going to just be so crucial here in the coming months. Most likely, um, they will put it back up for an election. We might even have a May election on whether or not we want to go back to the old ways of saying that homelessness is criminalized throughout the city, or whether or not we want to have a focus on actually addressing the root issues and housing people. It, in so many ways, echoes that question of, of immigration. Just like we had to suffer and deal with the raids um, that were launched by the president and by the governor in response to Austin's sanctuary response, we've recently had to deal with the governor sending the um, the DPS under the bridges to sweep people out from under those bridges. There's so many echoes of those same issues that we are facing. And I'm so proud to be a part of a community where we aren't perfect. We don't have it all figured out. Um, I certainly don't have it all figured out, but a community that's willing to struggle and stand up and speak together to figure out how it is that we can send that different sort of inclusive message. So thank you guys so much for having me this afternoon, and I'm really excited to take your questions and talk with you more about it. Thank you. This is working. Oh, I was talking through two mics.
you. I'm Lolly Lockhart, and I'm really uh, interested. You were saying just a few minutes ago that there were so many organizations and agencies and such that were asking what can they do. My question is, what are the opportunities for individuals to provide temporary housing uh, for people? And I'm not speaking just out of the blue. In the last 30 years, I have taken in 25 people that were not just, they were people who just had bad things happen, friends of friends and people coming through the church and that sort of thing. And I, I just wonder how if there's no system. This was just a personal thing that people mm -hmm. would send people to yeah. me. Yeah, no, I think in so many ways we have to create a more coherent system just like there have, has been this increased um, network of churches on the sanctuary front for immigrant families. I think that the system has for too long been too fragmented on the uh, homeless services side. And so what we hope is we've built out a pa whole page on the city's website dedicated to homelessness where we hopefully will soon be able to show people the good work that we're doing together and show folks places where they can volunteer because I think there's so many people that say how can I help apart from if you know if you can give to an organization can you give but what is what is actually serving or helping somebody look like what which how do different churches and faith organizations get involved but we're behind on that front and I hear that question all the time but you asking it it helps because then on at our work session on Tuesday I'm gonna flick on my microphone and say the same thing to the city manager which is when are we gonna have that portal where people can can help because I think there's a lot of folks that feel helpless right driving by the bridge or that intersection uh, every day or every week and feeling some level of hopelessness of well what are we ever going to do to fix this and finding a place for people to do that is really important so thank you for raising that and um, and it would be great for us to make sure we stay plugged in so that we can get that information out to people as the city better builds that system hello my name is Nicole Hi. True um, great talk by the way that was very Thank inspiring um, I didn't even need that little piece of paper it was like a security blanket <laughs> right at first here. Yeah. I know but then y'all were very smiling and friendly so I felt like I could put it away so um, my mother is she lives in San Antonio and I talk to her frequently about issues that are happening in Austin and we've talked about the homeless issue because as someone like I'm a lawyer I go downtown I park there under 35 and it gets it's it's uncomfortable yep. and tragic and like makes me cry, but then I'm like, can I trust this person I'm about to pull up next to? Yep. And all these weird conflicting feelings. Um, but she, she talked about how in San Antonio they have something called Haven for Hope, mm -hmm. which is a big acreage and mm -hmm. it's outdoors covered. And I think they provide some, I don't, some housing and, and, and services all in one place. Is there anything, I know the governor talked about trying to get five acres by the airport to do like some relocation yep. from downtown. Is there any organizing on the city's part to try and put all the services together in one place and if people want to stay outside, they can be outside rather than like at the arch where everyone's forced kind of inside. Yeah. Happy to talk about, uh, I think you brought up two really important points. So one was just about discomfort and challenges, and I think that's actually really important, and I uh, even wrote that on my piece of paper that I needed to talk about that, and I missed it, because y'all made me comfortable. But, uh, but no, but I think, you know, so much of what, uh, of, it, it is entirely valid and entirely many people's experience, right, that many of us have uh, had negative experiences potentially with folks that have been housed and folks that are not housed, right? And a lot of the people that have been most traumatized by our society and on the street the longest period of time, it's no, it should be no surprise that they're gonna have worst uh, medical outcomes and mental health outcomes and that, that people that have been struggling a lot are gonna struggle in lots of ways and a lot of times that's gonna be uncomfortable. And that has been magnified by um, the, the way that uh, media stories really elevate those issues to make it seem like it's everywhere and it's constant. So that that time or that one time or that two times or those three times where you've had a challenging experience, it makes it feel or seem like it's going to happen all the time to all people. Um, but the, the information we've gotten back from our police department is that in fact um, there has been no noticeable, now that we have decriminalized you know, sleeping under a bridge with a tent, there isn't any change in the number of people experiencing homelessness or 
in, you know, it's not like we decriminalized assault or harassment, right? But there has been so much communication as if we have that it makes a lot of people that I know feel more tense or more worried about it. The governor recently retweeted a video of a man throwing a street sign at a car. Now, the person throwing the street sign, first of all, was not asleep, and so it couldn't have had anything to do with the camping law. Second of all, the person that threw the street sign wasn't experiencing homelessness. Um, but of course, that was already retweeted thousands of times and shared in the news tons of times. The person w was having the worst day of their life uh, and a mental health issue. And the video was over two years old. And so, of course, it, um, and of course, the governor said, this is what decriminalizing homelessness in Austin five months ago did in a time machine two years ago to somebody that's not experiencing homelessness. So I think in part, right, we have to find a way to, uh, when we're talking to our neighbors and when we're having dinner and when you're on your neighborhood email list or at church, to find a way for us to have those honest conversations that don't shy away from f feeling uncomfortable that is, are you gonna roll down the window and give money to somebody and are they gonna be having a horrible day? Um, or, or that somebody's experience, potentially with somebody experiencing homelessness may have been terrible. Um, but that how does putting someone in jail potentially because they put a tent over their head this last weekend when it was cold, how does that solve that? You know, and I think the fact that that just took me a few minutes to say is part of the reason that it's so hard because we get everything in that quick snippet in that retweet of a video two years ago when nobody even knows what it really was about. The fact that it takes us those few minutes is what makes doing the right thing oftentimes so hard because you actually have to be able to have that connection. Um, so I want to acknowledge and I think it's important for us to validate those experiences for people. And then second on Haven for Hope. You know, that's, um, th that is one of many models of how to address um, homelessness in San Antonio what we understand is the amount of money that oftentimes goes to that, to things like that, it, it does help, but it is not always the maximum use of reducing homelessness in that community. And so with that much money, of oftentimes the now seen as national best strategy is actually a housing first strategy where we try to get folks into housing quicker rather than putting a large number of people in a larger shelter environment. So there do need to be shelter beds and we actually have opened up more shelter because shelter needs to be a part of it. Salvation Army just opened a new shelter off of Tannehill in East Austin, uh, a large, new, beautiful building, particularly for women and children. And that will free up some of their shelter beds downtown. At the Arch, actually, in fact, um, many of the people that oftentimes sit outside the Arch aren't waiting, are no longer waiting to get inside of the Arch. It's just that people would get shooed away from so many other parts of the city that that's just where they would congregate to. Um, but the arch is, is now full and people, there's no longer a line to get into the arch. So quite a while back, you would wait in line to get, it, to get your spot, but that would cause problems because people would just sit out there hoping to get in. And so now you actually are assigned a spot based on your level of vulnerability. And so there not, though, there's not lines of people waiting to get in. Um, it is just more that as we uh, used to shoo people away from the bridges or from in, s in front of certain buildings or what have you, that is where people oftentimes wound up. Um, so but the, that begs the question of, well, then what is the strategy? And a lot of the strategy is, how is it that we get folks into, um, have some extra shelter, but in particular, how do we get folks into housing? Because when you get them into housing temporarily, then people can get their um, there are benefits, we can connect people with jobs, we can get people sort of back on their feet, and then that housing unit can then quickly get opened up for the next person. Um, and then in some cases, folks need intensive, more permanent supportive housing. There's an amazing development called Housing First Oak Springs on Oak Springs over in East Austin, being run by Integral Care that helps keep folks in housing that oftentimes were the most chronically homeless with the most chronic challenges. And then there's also amazing opportunities at places like Community First, uh, which is run by Mobile Loaves and Fishes, and if you haven't been, you absolutely should go. I talked about it like it was the greatest thing ever without having been, and then when I actually went, I realized I had no idea what I was talking about. It really, it is just an amazing uh, place where folks have formed community, because so much of experiencing homelessness and being moved by the police from one place to another and being in hiding is not having connections and family and friends and supports 
And so there, there's a farm and jobs and real community building. And so in many ways, Austin actually is um, show, being a, a model for housing first. But what we have failed to do is actually scale that to actually help the number of people that need help. Houston got a big infusion of federal funds under the Obama administration and cut their population of people experiencing homelessness by nearly 50%. And I hope that we can sort of do the same thing. Just in the last, uh, I guess a year and a half ago, over the course of one year, we had some federal funds and cut the number of youth sleeping on the street unsheltered by half in just one year. And in the last two months have housed almost 450 people. Oftentimes with a strategy of getting a person into an apartment. And those might be apartments that have non-homeless folks in them, and we set aside five or 10 of them, or it might be buying these hotels and motels like you've seen in the news. Hi. Hi. Um, you said something that got me interested. It was about how domestic violence is a big contributor yeah. to the unsheltered. What? Closer? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Um, and um, I guess I'd never really thought about that, but I would assume that would be mostly women on the streets and maybe That's young right. people like teenagers right. and stuff. That's right. Is that a big percentage? Of it's a very significant percentage. I don't know the number, but it's very, very significant. Uh -huh. um, um, and it, it, some LGBTQ youth mm -hmm. oftentimes enter homelessness um, when they come out. Uh, domestic violence in particular for women um, um, and LGBTQ couples, especially when you have a level of financial dependence um, that folks escape and then have nowhere to go. A lot of people that sleep in their cars um, are women and families yeah. escaping those sorts of situations. And so something that we've, you know, one great organizations like SAFE and LifeWorks um, are especially focused on those populations on housing them. And recently part of what we've been asking at the city is that some of the dollar, a lot of the places where we've actually seen violent crime increases in our city or significant chunks of violent crime actually are domestic violence, um, relationship violence, which no matter how many cars you have, patro police patrol you have on the street, you're never going to address, you, it doesn't uh, adequately address that issue. And so we've actually funded um, these crisis, emergency crisis funds that, that SAFE distributes that are um, on our domestic violence hotline so that when somebody calls, to address that issue, we actually have the $300 to get you a bus to stay with your sister, or the deposit for an apartment so that you don't go wind up on the street. And then once you're on the street, you could stay on the street. And so that is, um, that's something we're having to look really closely at, but it's actually, I don't know the percentage, but it's a very, it's a really significant percentage. Rent's going up, loss of a job, medical bill. I think those are the, you know, very large, but domestic violence is right there under those. Uh, thank you for asking that, ma'am. Hi, my name's Elaine Hi, Cohen. Elaine. Hi, Greg. Um, you've been covering this in a really wonderful way and what you just said about rents. And I'm wondering, is there something that can be done at the city council level to rein back the greed of the property owners who have made the rentals in this city to be so extraordinarily high? And um, I think from what I've been reading, that's one of the reasons for homelessness is you can't get together the $1,000 to put a first and last month's yeah. deposit. And you can't pay $1,000 a month for a one bedroom or a studio if you're barely making $300 a week. So it seems to me there is this we're doing all these things that are like good band-aids. They're important, but the root cause is the fact that the rents have disproportionately gone over what the salaries are. Yeah, it's a huge issue. Did you have an add-on question to that? Um, I just had a couple of quick comments. One was about the community first. You had invited people to go. And I just wanted to say that I was at um, browsing through the Alamo Draft House thing, and they had donated a theater to the people yeah. as well, outdoor theater. And during the summer, they actually have showings that they invite the public to, and you, you can make a donation and come and enjoy them and eat. They have trailers and things, and it'll actually help fund the cause. And then I just had another uh, comments about if you do house people at places like Bergstrom, 
I heard that you know the, the trailer parks and whatnot had disappeared. The transportation problem was such an issue. Um, getting transportation, are y'all addressing that? that? If people move out, how do they get in? You know, without having the car and the insurance, you know, and all those expenses. And also, I know just from when my son went um, to get an apartment locally, his, um, you know, the apartments are so inefficient. They had to have three of them, you know, share an apartment. One of them was sleeping on a couch. And their um, AC bills, you know, for during the summer on a small two-bedroom apartment were like three times what my big two-bedroom yeah. house, you know, is. So there should be some kind of rules for landlords or something, you know, to have um, these big apartment buildings, you know, to have some kind of efficiency or something, requirements. Yeah. Anyway. So uh, let me get to both of y'all's questions. Um, so, uh, yeah, absolutely rising rent and stagnating wages is a huge cause of homelessness, and, and you can see that, it, especially in the most expensive cities like Los Angeles and Seattle, you know, where you have way more folks experiencing homelessness in, that, in those cities than you have here, and a way higher per capita rate of people experiencing homelessness than here. Certainly, you know, Band-Aids are important because when you're cut, you, you need it. Uh, and there are uh, actually, for example, fewer people experiencing homelessness here than in Dallas. Uh, fewer people per capita than in Dallas, even though our rents obviously have skyrocketed. And I think a key part of that has to do with the amazing, amazing social uh, service providers and the partnerships with local government that we have here, certainly still not even close to enough. Um, but as far as, as rents, it is the number one issue when I knock on doors in my community. My district is the lowest income district in the city of Austin. It's the number one issue that is brought up. Um, it will be no surprise to you that rent control is illegal in Texas, has been made illegal in Texas, and, um, and is illegal in actually in many states. But also lots of other basic measures that are allowed in other states are not allowed here. We, um, we charge new buildings and new developers of large developments uh, parks fees and water fees, you know, to connect your pipes to the water or to help build out the park nearby. Um, transportation fees to build a crosswalk or a sidewalk near your new major development. Um, so we thought pretty early on in my term to sponsor affordable housing fees to say, you know, part of what large developments should pay into is an affordable housing fund. And it was almost no time after that um, the Home Builders Association went to uh, the Texas State Legislature and had a bill passed very, very quickly and signed saying affordable housing fees are banned in Texas. Um, one thing we worked on was to say, well, people experiencing real housing risk and insecurity, we should increase the number of housing vouchers that people have um, so that they can um, maybe make up that gap between what they can afford and the rent, understanding that they're still very willing to pay some chunk, but it's that gap. Um, what we found was a lot of landlords weren't taking the vouchers. We're discriminating against people who are coming to pay with a, a voucher. And so a law was passed to say you can't discriminate against people already on their se sex or their race. Um, you shouldn't discriminate against people if they're paying you with a check or if they're paying you with a voucher. Well, it wasn't very long after that that the apartment association went to the state government and we are now have the disgrace of being the only state in America that has a protection for discrimination against voucher holders. And so in many ways, you know, we are trying to swim upstream on these issues. And part of it has to do with one, trying 15 things, because they can maybe only outlaw 13 of them, and then we still kept our two. Um, and uh, figuring out how to do some of it ourselves with the limited tools that we have. And part of that has to do with the city investing our own dollars, our own money, into affordable housing. That's why we passed the affordable housing bond uh, last year, the most significant affordable housing bond of any southern city ever, um, which means that we're actually going and, and having the city participate in the rehabilitation or construction of low-income housing. And when the city puts its money in, then we still have the power of contracts. The state doesn't take that away. Um, and so we can require lower rents and lower increases in the rent. Just this one year alone, we'll have uh, required lower rents on over 1,000 homes. Uh, mostly new, thanks to the voters having approved that, and we will keep doing that for the next six years um, with that money. And another part is using city land, because uh, just like landlords want to have the protections for their leases, the city still has the same protections landlords have, and to try to utilize our own land to put lower cost, low income housing in that would be high quality and where we can mandate lower rents. 
and then finally figuring out how it is that uh, we continue to not have a shortage of housing in the city. We're growing, as you know, at an extremely rapid rate. Over four million people will live in this area in the coming years. We've, the region has doubled in population every 25 years for pretty much forever. And the challenge is as that population grows and as national income inequality continues to go like this, um, and we have a set amount of land and a set amount of housing, how do, does that not create these huge artificial price spikes like we've seen? And so that means figuring out how to fit housing, how to make sure that that housing uh, has a broader variety of costs associated with it rather than it all being such luxury housing, and how is it not built on top of existing low-income people because every time you have a low-income apartment complex knocked over and then uh, high-income um, apartments built on top of it, then it actually worsens that, continues to worsen that situation. And so it's really hard, but it is at the core of what it is that we have to figure out how to do is how do we continue to create, create new tools even as the legislature takes them away? How do we use the resources we have, the money we have, and the land we have? And then how do we make room for new housing um, without displacing our working class neighbors, but make room for new housing knowing that if we don't, then we will artificially have too little housing for the number of people here. And as I say, if you had a pitcher three quarters full of water and you're poor, no another pitcher three quarters full of water is coming, then you're gonna have displacement. And so we have to make, find ways to make the pitcher bigger, have to find ways to fit more people in the limited space that we have. Otherwise, we'll have continued people being pushed out to the edge. I know you have the microphone though. Oh, and you do too. Um, I work for Hospice Austin, which is uh, the only nonprofit hospice in the Central Texas area. And one of the ways that we see immigration and homelessness really overlap is um, with people who have terminal illnesses. We right. get almost every person who has a terminal illness on hospice because the other ones, you know, won't take them. Um, they can't get access to services like nursing home Medicaid, like other people even experiencing homelessness or poverty might be able to access because they're not. If they're undocumented, they don't have access to those kinds of services. And so what we end up seeing is folks who have nowhere to go, including you know, somebody who has something like cancer, terminal cancer, um, who can't really care for themselves. Um, even the shelter system doesn't really help them or solve you know, their issues um, because it's an in and out kind of situation, which a lot of folks you know, uh, physically aren't able to do. And so it's just something that I would love for the city to think about when they're thinking about their shelters. Um, you know, if there's some way that we could serve people who are undocumented, who are at the end of their lives, um, who are not, you know, experiencing an immediate crisis, but something like COPD, cancer, chronic and life-limiting illnesses, um, finding ways that we can serve them as a city through our shelters, um, if that's something that they need. Yeah, well, let's talk about that here at the end of the, of the meeting, because I... Uh, you know, nobody's actually brought that up to me directly like that before, and it just seems like in that moment you, it should be different. And so thank you for bringing that up. Well, I see so many of these problems can be helped if the people in the state legislature would have uh, a turnover to where <laughs> because it's every everything things you haven't even mentioned the school the the Robin Hood stealing the tax dollars for the schools in cities like Austin what I don't know what percent 50 percent 40 percent of the tax dollars the Austin people pay goes to the other school districts and then we're stuck with nothing. That's the people in the state government that say, yeah, we don't want our state dollars to go to the schools. We want these cities to pay the schools all around the state. Oh, I'm getting a little bit riled. But it's so many areas are affected from Medicaid to the school finance to all the laws that you can't have vouchers to pay rent. I mean, it's everything. So everybody encourage your neighbors to go vote if they're of like mind. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I think about that when I wake up and go to bed. <laughs> Hi. Thank you so much for being here today. It's been really helpful for me because, as you said, it's so quick to get that 
instant little tweet or that thing on the news which doesn't give us much of a chance to really get the, the three or four minute answer you've got to get. So thank you for that. My question has to do with uh, addiction and alcoholism. Because yeah. do you have, is there any, are there any figures that have a percentage of, of the homeless? How many of them are uh, in, the, in that area? And what can we do to connect them to either rehab, uh, detox, or best of all, 12-step program? Yeah, I, I, I don't have the exact percentages on me, but they are actually a part of this survey that I was describing. Uh -huh. But what I do know is that it certainly is a much smaller percentage of people that become homeless because of those issues in particular, right? The main drivers of homelessness are things like the rent or a bill or domestic violence. But then clearly as part of sort of self-medication and making it living on the street, the longer that somebody lives on the street, the more and more we see those sorts of issues. And that's part of why um, it is the longer somebody's on the street, the more expensive it is to serve them. Because as you could imagine then, then you not only have to do the apartment bed, but you need the social services or the detox or the addiction services that somebody needs uh, to sort of be able to get back on into their normal life. Uh, and so, so, so yes, that absolutely is an issue that a lot of the folks that we're trying to house face. And how is there budgeting for that? I mean, how, do, how are you going, to, how are we trying to deal with that? Yeah, yeah, so that, that gets budgeted in to how this works. And so that's why somewhere like Housing First Oak Springs that I described is more expensive to run. So there's some people that they just need help getting through that one month's rent and not getting evicted and a tiny bit of money and you kept somebody from being homeless. Someone else who has lived on the street for years and has dealt with all of those demons, that person it's more expensive. And so that is part of this bigger budget of what it, of what it actually takes. We know that people are facing different situations. And and people do, have, you know, there are lots of folks, housed and unhoused, that have had to overcome those, those challenges and issues. And so we actually have some very um, experienced people in that area. One thing that we recently expanded was um, a program to, where there's jobs to actually go and clean under, underpasses and pick up the trash. And we have folks that are in, experiencing homelessness that we're putting into housing to do that sort of work and to do that work together. So there's those sort of, there are those sorts of programs in, the, in that medical help, but certainly not, not nearly enough. But it is, it's real. It's real that it happens. And part of the challenge is when there's a level of judgment saying, well, because you suffer from alcoholism, then I guess we can't help you. Well, then it perpetuates that problem and it's that continued, well, that person just can't be helped. But the fact of the matter is, and when we accept that that oftentimes happens because of the homelessness and we find people can get help. I am sitting down, giving it to you. Perfect. Just oh. to that. Thank, you. Thank you for your question, though. It's a, it's a so really important one. We're just past 3 o'clock. We have a few more questions. Sure, our I've got time. Our contract it's with the time. folks is from 2 to 3. So, and I know that there's some announcements to be made, and I know your friend James Tellerico has his kickoff at 4 o'clock. I know, I'm going to get to that. <laughs> okay. As long as I don't stay here till 4, then I won't be breaking anything. Exactly. But no, I won't be offended if anybody has to go. Well, I, I have a short question before we get yes, to sir. the next person. Uh, I recently got into a, uh, a social media debate with somebody because there was something on social media about did closing mental hospitals around the country create or exacerbate homelessness? such as in Texas, we used to th have a thing called MHMR, yep. and they're mostly gone. Um, is that an answer to reopen those? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know as much um, on the mental health front as I, as I should. Um, one, thing, uh, one thing that has <coughs> certainly happened is we've de disinvested from mental health. And so my understanding, which again, here it's like lots, lots of... of um, of just like warning, I don't know as much about this as I would like to, is that the hope was to go from a big institutionalized model to more of this uh, decentralized model, right, where people would be in smaller homes. But my understanding is that there has just been so little support for that smaller home system, and where many of those smaller homes now, um, we know, are uh, have become sort of f uh, factories for running people through them and not actually giving people the care that they need and overstuffing people into boarding houses. And so I think a lot, I know less about which of the models is the right model, but what I do know is there's just been such a divestment from the help that people need. So I think the promise was instead of people being in one big hospital, let's have people be more integrated into society and still provide that level of help. 
and once they got rid of that level of help, then now it's, we have lots of houses that are understaffed hospitals. Um, and that is, uh, you know, obviously a huge challenge. But whether people are coming here all over the country because those things got shut down, that's not true. Gavin Newsom, gov um, governor of uh, California, said, well, most people homeless here in California are actually from Texas. <laughs> and PolitiFact said, pants on fire, just like, you know, now you'll have probably Texas officials saying, oh, they're all coming from California. There is no uh, secret voter's guide if you're a person experiencing homelessness of like four and five star places to go. Um, um, you know, it, it, most of it is, it's, it's just trying to avoid the fact that this is our problem. This is a thing that is happening with us. And frankly, I, uh, you know, it's not popular to say, but if there was some person who is out in the suburbs somewhere experiencing homelessness and heard that Austin is a kinder and more compassionate place and they did come here because they heard it wouldn't be as terrible for them here, that also is not a horrible thing. Yeah. It's actually not a horrible thing. But, you know, I, I know this is on video and so now the governor might tweet about it or something. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for coming. Hi. Uh, you're among friends. I know. And I'm a fan. Um, I've been following your work and I have a lot of, uh, my, my question is kind of like a different level to the other medical questions that you've already addressed. Yes, ma'am. I have a lot of friends who are in the medical field and I would like to be empowered with, the, with something to argue with them because they're very concerned about diseases mm -hmm. that may spring up amongst the homeless community that may spread in the Austin community. And I know nothing about that, but yeah. is there any way that you can address, like, do we have a system in, in, in place to prevent stuff like that from happening and empower me with arguments for right. <laughs> to fight with these people yeah. about this issue, please? Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. And I'm gonna answer it in two pieces because it's a great way for us to wrap up. Number one, I think part of what we talked about is how, um, how we have to communicate back about how, this, how, how people are our neighbors and how we can do better as Austin. And um, I hope that pretty soon there will be a more um, frequently asked questions and truths versus myths sort of communications work and easy things for y'all to have that you can, so you can, you know, I asked, hey, please talk to people at the dinner table, but you may not know what the truths and myths are, because I'm only learning about those. And so what I would love from y'all is, uh, as we leave and think about it, some commitment that if we get those facts versus myths stuff out, that y'all will use them. So I, I, I'll hopefully get them to you guys and find ways for y'all to have that stuff, because there's so many myths. Uh, and on the fact, question of communicable diseases, that is something, again, that our health department has gone and said, no, there is no, we have not found any level of, of that kind of public health crisis in the city. Now, the fact of the matter is, there is a real health crisis amongst people experiencing homelessness. If you experience homelessness, your life expectancy is about 30 years shorter than if you're a person that is housed. So of course, it is really harsh and really hard out there. And so what we're trying to do is be able to provide those folks better services. And when they aren't getting moved around by police hiding from bridge to bridge or creek to back alley, we know we can give people better health and services. And, um, and that not locking folks up for being homeless, that change doesn't create more homelessness or create more disease. And so it's not like, like decriminalizing homelessness has created more homelessness. So in some cities there have been increases of really serious disease amongst people experiencing homelessness and we work really hard to make sure people have their medication and get vaccinated and have that kind of help. And we, but the best way for us to work on it is to actually house people. But there is no big public health crisis out there. Um, there is no large increase in the number of needles or, or, whatever, or whatever else that you might read because in the end it's not like there is some huge increase in the number of folks experiencing homelessness. Now it's just when you drive by the bridge and before it was kind of dark outside and you couldn't see the person laying there, now they're in a little blue tent and so you can see them. And when you've heard about it on the news two times that day and when somebody else was talking about it and then you see it, there's this sense that all of a sudden now there's tons more people, but they've uh, been with us. Um, if you look at 
our survey today compared to eight years ago, we have about the same number of people experiencing homelessness today as eight years ago, even though our city population has grown. However, we, then we had a dip about four or five years ago, and we have more today than we had four or five years ago. And so it kind of goes like this, and our hope is to make it go like this. So we'll get you the information. Hey, Amen. We can go on for a long time. There are lots of people who ask questions, but I really, uh, I know there's research more after this. Can we go for five more minutes? Yeah, it's mostly me having to keep my answers shorter. I know it's not you guys' fault, so. Yeah. Uh, hi, Greg. Uh, we, hey. We've talked before. Um, for those of y'all that don't know me in this church, I used to work for the city of Austin as a lifeguard. And as a lifeguard, um, in our pools, I interacted with the homeless community a fair amount because um, our pools and our parks are one of the few places where homeless folks can go use the restroom, take a shower. And um, it was not something that I felt prepared to do um, in my job. Like nobody told me when I was in lifeguard class that like, hey, you're gonna have to mediate a fight between two folks at six in the morning about who gets to shower first. And um, you know, I noticed at the public libraries that yeah. there are now like little table tents on the tables telling people where they can get social services if they are experiencing homelessness because a lot of our homeless neighbors rely on the libraries for a similar reason. And I was just, you know, you know me, I love my pools. I was wondering if there were any plans to use that in pools or parks or other places where we know our homeless neighbors um, come to use the city's resources. Yeah, so that's an awesome question. And just like you were the first person to ask me about this, you're the second person, Amanda, to mention uh, the parks. So we actually did kick off this pilot program of having social workers in our libraries, recognizing that we have to find different points of entry for folks experiencing homelessness to get to housing. And we know, so, and it seemed to have quite a bit of success, one, to support our librarians who signed up to be librarians, and oftentimes they're social workers and childcare workers and all these other things, but to have that expertise. And I do think the next step is, especially around our parks where some folks sleep, or our pools um, and parks facilities where folks use the bathroom and showers, I think that that is the next place for us to add some of those resources and some of that help. You're gonna see in our city budgets a ton of strain coming soon because the state government, to your point, recently decided to cap the growth of, of city budgets at about 2.5, or sorry, 3.5%, but the 3.5% property tax growth makes it so other parts that grow slower keeps our whole pie very small. And so just to keep up with healthcare costs and new fire stations and new police stations, it's, we can't even keep up with that uh, anymore. And so you're gonna probably see in the news in the coming year us struggling to figure out, well, if we want social workers to st go to the next set of libraries and the next set of parks and we wanna do this affordable housing thing, how are we gonna open the fire station that we promised to open? How do we keep up with the pension obligations? And again, a lot of it is us being put into this world of scarcity by uh, laws at a higher level than us, saying, well, you can't have a income tax on the highest incomes or you, we're not gonna raise the business tax on the highest grocery corporations in the state or, this, or the city and you can't grow your own tax base more than X percent. And so we get pit against one another in these wars of scarcity between parks and libraries and fire stations. And so that's a lot of the job and a lot of what you'll be seeing, but it's a really good, it's a really good idea and we just have to figure out how to make it work. Hi, Greg. Hi. Uh, thanks so much for being here. My name is Brian Gibson, and uh, Hi, Brian. this is my wife, Susan. We do prison ministry work. And, oh, great. Um, obviously, I don't have to tell you the biggest challenges that ex-offenders face yeah. is reintegration. And the two biggest issues are housing and employment. Yeah. Um, I just want to commend you and the rest of the city council for the amazing work you've done with Fair Chance. Um, it's really given an opportunity for a lot of ex-offenders. My question is, what are the next steps? What is the council doing to put more teeth into the great first steps that you've already done? Yeah. So as I had mentioned, right, we passed the Fair Chance Hiring Ordinance, which asks your background check to not get run until you've had an interview and had a chance, and that um, if somebody's gonna disqualify you based on that background, that it has to actually be related to the, to the job. And we know that a lot of people actually don't know they have this new right. We know that there's a lot of employers that need educating about the rules. And so something we're hoping to establish is actually a small civil rights unit within the city 
to better ensure that people are following the water breaks laws or following our anti-discrimination rules or things like fair chance hiring. I'm not sure 100% exactly what the best next step is myself because we're trying to have people that work in the field, formerly incarcerated folks, service providers, um, really lead on what the next steps for that is, but we know it needs more focus. And so we'd love to chat with you after this because that is actually upcoming um, to really figure out, is it that more people need to know their rights? Is it that more employers need to be educated? Is it that there, needs, that there are some serial offenders as far as employers that need to actually be the first folks to get some fines levied against them so that everybody gets the message? You know, which combination of these things are the, are the best way? Uh, and then on housing, it is a real serious question that we're going to start looking at is, is there some reasonable um, rules that we could write about how far back somebody should be looking for somebody's criminal history when they're thinking of renting an apartment? Because sometimes people are getting denied an apartment and their conviction history is 20 years old. Um, and, and right now, with so many people looking for a place to live and so few places to live, folks are saying no because they expect that two or three days later they'll, just, they'll have somebody else applying for that spot. So we'd love to chat with you after it, but my hope is that the city creates a civil rights office that really focuses on making sure that people's rights that we've won at city council actually happen. Thank you though. Let's please talk afterwards. Hi Greg, thanks Hi for coming. Um, I just have a quick question about, is there any effort to provide housing now that Austin is divided into the different districts? Is there an effort to provide housing equally in all the different districts in Austin or what is your feeling about that? Yeah, it's really, again, I feel like I've started every answer with, it's really hard. <laughs> but, it's, but, it's, but it's good work because it's hard. So yes, we have actually passed a commitment that we want uh, to house our homeless neighbors in each and every single city council district, um, which is really, really powerful and really important. Uh, and a continued challenge, of course, is that we want to help people as fast as we can and as many people as we can with limited resources. And those sorts of constraints perpetuate injustices as well, right? Because of course, the cheaper hotels and the cheaper rooms and the ones where we can get more bang for our buck are overwhelmingly gonna be on highways near lower income communities. And those lower income communities are welcoming places that uh, the, the, where the vast majority of folks are going to say, yes, I want to do this, but then the fact is that will continue to perpetuate the segregation in our city and injustices in our city and create resentment that is unnecessary in our city. And so there is some amount of money that we probably have to pay, some sort of premium that has to probably exist for some of that to exist in western portions of the city that are more expensive that is really hard for the everyday person to understand or for somebody to understand in a tweet. But that is, a, again, a hard component as we think about how much something costs. We're going to be able to help fewer people at a higher cost to do it in a place where you wouldn't expect it. But we probably do need to do some of that. And so that's part of the moral wrangling that we have to do when we are doing the real work on the, on the local level. But if all of them wind up in the same two areas of town, it, it, that's an injustice in and of itself. And I forgot to answer the question about out by the airport to the governor's field. You know, but that is, again, this sort of really Spartan, simple solution where it's, well, if we'll have an open field and we'll have porta potties there, and, and then if we kick somebody out from under a bridge, we say, well, why don't you go to the field? And that is the sort of um, denial of people's autonomy, right? If it was such a great place, then people would obviously choose to be there. And so my hope is that we create places where folks say, this is better. And I'll end with this, you know, uh, it was really stirring and powerful and I felt good and horrible all at once. Um, um, a great journalist from the Texas Observer asked a, a person who was now sleeping in a tent under I-35, what has changed for you? And she said, having the tent is a billion times better. And it's good news, but it's also horrible, right? That a tent can make your life a billion times better, right? That, that before we were punishing people and taking away the tent because we didn't like the way that it looked or the way that it made us feel, and that the least we could do is let you have a tent to make your life a billion times better, and knowing that people deserve so much more than that tent. 
Uh, and that's really what's at stake. That's the conversation. I think the citywide conversation we're going to have here in the next few months is that you know a jail is not a home. Uh, if the tent is a billion times better, can't we do so much better than we've been doing? And so, um, so thank all of you guys for your questions and for your time. And I'll stick around for a little bit. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, folks, we're just about done. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, you now know the importance of voting, and there's no accident you're sitting in blue chairs. Um, so, uh, if you want to hear uh, Craig a couple more times this month, he's holding some town hall meetings around, the, around your district, correct? Where are they going to be? Um, if, if you if, if y'all are on um, if y'all are on Facebook my, on my Facebook page I tend to keep my town halls up and going but I'm at a variety of neighborhood groups throughout the month especially talking about uh, the land development code and how we fit housing in the city. Fantastic! Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. And we still have coffee and cake.